Hello, you are listening to the Divorce University Online Podcast with your host, Tammy Ferreira. Hi, this is Tammy, and this week we're going to talk about five court mistakes that will hurt your child custody case. Now, I can tell you from working with hundreds of people that it's much easier for you to get these things right going in than it is to try to correct them after the fact. And if you are trying to correct them after the fact, hopefully you can use this the next time that you're in front of your judge. And if you haven't gone in front of your judge yet, then you're in the right place because this is going to give you a leg up going into it. Okay. So how can you make sure that you are not making the judge angry when you go in to, to appear in your case? And how do you make sure that the judge listens to you and try to make sure that they understand what is going on in your case? And in child custody in particular, I think courts really want to get to the bottom of what's happening in the family so that they can make the judgment that's in the best interest of the children. So the first and foremost, most important thing that you can do is for you to understand court procedures. And, you know, this comes down to just maybe going and watching court, observing, um, and, and just exposing yourself, especially if you've never been around anything like this, so that you know one, how to dress. Okay. You dress business. Attorneys wear suits, right? There's a reason. Why does an attorney wear a suit going into the courtroom? Because they want to show respect. They want to show deference to the judge. So you don't want to show up in an, in an outfit that says, I don't really take this too seriously. You know, if you're showing up in a t-shirt and shorts and flip-flops, you're probably not going to make a good first impression. And we always say, you only get one chance, right, to make a good first impression. And so that's real important. You want to make sure your appearance is in line with a courtroom decorum. You know, you also don't want to go the other direction, especially ladies. I've seen this a lot where you go in and you're, you know, wearing something that's kind of more on the um, attract, not that you shouldn't be attractive, but maybe more a provocative side or you've got large heels very high heels on and things like that. You know, we're not going to a nightclub. We're not, we're not going in to try to seduce our judge, right? We want to appear, appear very business, very serious, and let the court know that this is, this is an important issue to us and that we take it seriously. The other thing that you have to understand is you do not want to speak at the same time as the other person. You don't want to talk over them. You want to wait your turn. And you need to understand that there's an order in how the court does things. Now, typically, whoever filed the motion that's in front of the court, they will get to go first. And so the second person that's the responding person will go second. And that can be a little frustrating, right? If you're the responding person and you're sitting here listening to the first person essentially attack you, right? That can be really frustrating. So what I tell people to do is, you know, especially self-represented people, take a notepad in so that you can take notes and that you can write down anything that's said that you want to be able to respond to when it's your time to speak. It's good to kind of be prepared with what you think that you want to say, but you do also need to be able to kind of think on your feet and address what the other side is saying. So that's the very first and foremost is that you want to understand the courtroom decorum and procedure. You want to address the judge or your commissioner as your honor, and you want to be extremely respectful in the way that, that you speak and your tone and all those kinds of things. The second thing that I think gets people in the most hot water is that the judge asks a question and they don't answer it. And here's what I mean by that. And, and I've actually, I've actually gone in and been sitting in the courtroom when clients were in court before and actually seen this play out in front of me, people that I've gone to court with to support them and actually seen them make this mistake. And what happens is the judge asks you a question like, 
how many times has, has the other parent seen the child in the last three months? And you start giving the whole history. Well, it's changed a lot. And three months ago, we came one weekend, but then it didn't work. And the children had this thing going on and we had to change the debt. And I have seen the judge cut that person off and then ask the question again. And the person will go into the whole litany of the explanation again. And so it's very frustrating with the court because when they're asking you a question like this, they're looking for a very specific answer. How many times has the person seen the child in the last three months? The answer might be, I'm not sure. You know, four to six times. I'm not sure of the exact number or as close as you can get. But to try to have this conversation kind of out loud in your head of like, well, this happened and that happened. And, you know, the courts are very limited on their time. They have uh, usually on a regular motion, they'll have anywhere from 15 to 20 cases on on a given morning that they have to get through all of those. They only have a maximum of usually 20 to 40 minutes per case. And if every case went 20 to 40 minutes, they wouldn't get through their whole calendar. So they're trying to push things along and get it resolved. And the more precise that you can be with your answers, the better off you're going to be and the less you're going to upset your judge. (laughs) Because if they're looking for a specific piece of information and you keep giving them this whole background, they're going to get more and more frustrated with you. And I actually had this happen with one client in particular where I was sitting there thinking, no, just answer the question, just answer the question. And the client kept coming back with explanation and the judge got quite frustrated and said, listen, I want a specific answer. If your answer is, I don't know, then that's fine. But say, I don't know. You know, don't think through out loud three months of your conversations back and forth with your ex over what's happened. And so it's real important that if the judge is asking a question, try to think of that question and think of the very specific answer. How many times has the other parent seen the child in the last three months? Like I said, you might know, you might have a calendar in front of you and might be able to say, just a moment, your honor, I can, I can calculate that. Boom, 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 12 times, you know, or it might be, I'm not sure exactly it's changed a lot, but I would estimate it to be four to six times. Or, you know, your honor, I'm not really sure what it's been over the last three months. I can tell you in the last one month, the other parent has seen the child three times. You know, those types of answers that are very succinct and to the point of what the court is actually asking of you. Now, I find people a lot of times get frustrated when they feel like the court is cutting them off, the judge is cutting them off, and not listening to the explanation that they want to give. And this is where your preparation ahead of time is really going to help you because you need to be brief. That is probably one of the other top mistakes that I see people make is they are not brief enough because we tend to want to give our whole life story, our whole explanation, and the court doesn't have time for that. You might have 10 things that the other parent has done wrong in the last six weeks, but you're not going to be able to get all 10 of those things in. You're going to have to pick what are my top two or three things and be able to present that information. And a lot of times I see clients go in and they're not brief enough. They end up getting cut off and then they didn't get in something that was really important and they feel really, really frustrated because then the judge makes a decision and they go, but the judge didn't even know this thing. And it's like, well, if that was so important, that should have been one of your key two or three things that you were presenting and you should have let all these other little things go. We tend to think that the more stuff we have to throw at it makes it more powerful. And that's actually not true. Actually throwing more stuff at it dilutes the key two, three, four max points that you have. And and Thomas would always say four max. You don't want any more than that. 
Beyond that, he used to say, your judge's eyes start to roll back in your head, right? So you really want to be focused. And it's it's not that those other points aren't maybe good points. We're not looking at how many good points do I have. We're looking at what are my three or so very best, most um, impactful points that I have to make. Now, again, in the last episode, I talked about getting educated. And this is important in this regard because it's not the three things that you think are most important. A lot of times in child custody cases, what we feel like is important as a parent or what we see as important for the sake of our child isn't necessarily something that is going to influence the judge's decision. You have to remember that that judge is making their findings based on the law in your state, and that's what they're looking to. So you want your points to tie back to things that are in line with the child custody laws in your state. You don't get as much effect when you're just expecting the judge to look at what's reasonable or what you think is reasonable, because that's not the approach that they're coming at it with. Judges are lawyers and they're coming at it with that legal analysis. And that's what they're looking for. How, what decision do I make according to the law in this state? You know, what should my finding be? And so again, as lay people, we tend to think of reasonableness, but that is not the judge's criteria. And so you have to understand that when you're making your points and make sure that you're trying to line up your points with what is going to be important in the judge's view based on how they make their decision. Okay. The next thing that I think that um, people do a lot, and I always find this one a little bit shocking. (laughs) I'm always shocked that it's sort of like when you go into a store and you see somebody arguing with the person behind the counter or, or being nasty to them or getting into it with them or being rude to their server at a restaurant or, or any of that type of thing. And I just sit back and I think, how does that person think that they're going to get good service by treating that person that way? Or how do they think they're going to get what they want by treating the other person that way? And this is what happens in family court is a lot of times the person wants, they they will tell the judge they're wrong. Well, your honor, you're wrong. That's not how this should be. Or that's not what, you know, the decision you should make or, or whatever. And they think that the court is wrong. And so they essentially tell them that. And I'll tell you one way that you can send that message to the judge without necessarily saying it out loud. And that is by filing multiple motions over and over and over around the same issues. Because you're essentially saying to the court, look, last time I was here, I don't think you got it right. So I'm going to file again. You know, we use an example where Thomas went to this case in in the next county over from us. Um, He went to to handle a case and he was sitting watching the court proceedings while he was waiting for his case to be called. And this couple got up and they were both self-represented and it was dad's motion and dad had filed to change custody. It was like his sixth or seventh motion in a row. And the, the, the judge said to him, sir, how many times are you going to keep bringing this same motion in front of me? And the guy said, as many times as it takes, which is essentially saying to the court, as many times as it takes for you to figure out that you're wrong and for you to change your finding and give me what I'm asking for. And you're not going to get the result you're looking for that way. That's called just pounding your head against a brick wall and then trying to figure out why you're bleeding, right? It's not going to solve the problem. What you have to do in in the situation where you're not getting the outcome you want from the court, you have to figure out why. Why is the judge making this finding? Why are they giving this order? What is the court's concern? If you're not getting the parenting time you want, if you're not getting Um, the outcomes that you want on your child custody case, it's probably because you are not addressing the court's concerns. 
you know, uh, Thomas had a case a few years ago where he went in and um, he was representing dad and dad had filed a couple motions self-represented kind of in this way, trying to get a different outcome from the court and had not been able to. So he came and he retained Thomas and Thomas went in and the court essentially left everything as it was. And the client was really, you know, visibly frustrated standing next to Thomas. And so Thomas said to the court, your honor, can I ask what is the court's concern? And then the court said, oh yeah, I'm concerned about dad's past history of drug use. And he was ordered to get a, um, an evaluation and he didn't. And Thomas is like, oh, okay, thank you. And so then at that point, he was able to say to the client, look, you need to go have the evaluation done. You know, you're, the, the court ordered you to go for a drug and alcohol assessment, you know, many, many months ago, like prior orders. And so you haven't completed that. And so the court has decided that they're not just going to change it until you've completed that, no matter what's transpired since then. So that's the court's concern. So as soon as you address the concern and you complete that evaluation and you go back in, assuming the evaluation comes out that you don't have a drug problem, right? If you do, there's probably going to be more things that you then need to do to remedy that issue. But assuming that it comes back that you don't, you've now addressed the court's concern and now you're likely to get more parenting time out of them. But when you just refuse or you don't, um, you know, address what their concern is, or you don't know what their concern is, then you're just kind of taking a stab at different random things, trying to figure out why you can't get the outcome you want. And you're feeling more and more frustrated as this process goes on. So, you know, you can ask the judge, you know, can I ask what the court's concern is? That's a great question, you know, or can I ask, you know, why the court doesn't feel that me having more parenting time is in the best interest of the children, then the court's probably going to say, well, I'm concerned that blah, 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 blah. I'm concerned that you and the other parent live an hour apart and that the children are going to spend 30 minutes in the car on, on the way to school, you know, or, or an hour, I guess, you know, if you live an hour apart, depending on where the school is, an hour on the way to school every morning. And these are young children and then they're going to have an hour transport home every night. Well, then you know what the court's concern is. You may not agree with it. You may not agree that the court uh, feeling concerned about the children traveling an hour each way is a problem. But the fact of the matter is, if that's the court's concern, then you at least know that you're not going to be able to increase your parenting time until that issue is addressed. So then maybe you take steps over the next few months to move 45 minutes closer where you're only 15 minutes away from the other parent and from the school. Then you file your motion. Then you go back in and say, your honor, I've moved, I've relocated, and I'm only 15 minutes from the school. This one hour drive is no longer an issue. And I'm asking for more parenting time through the week. Now you've addressed the concern of the court and you're more likely to get the outcome that you're looking for. But if you hadn't asked that question and you didn't know what the concern was, how would you even fix the problem? Because in your mind, if that hour drive isn't a problem, you may not even realize that the court thinks it's a problem. And so we have to understand that when we're in front of a judge, they're the decision maker. They're the trier of fact in your case. And so whether you agree with them or not is not always the question. It's not usually the question because they're the one in control. And so whether you agree with them or not, you have to address the concerns the court has in order to start to shift things to go the direction that you want them to go. And the last thing that I will tell you is the big mistake that I see people make is they don't follow the court's orders. <laughs> so they come back in on another motion and they haven't even complied with the prior orders, much in much like the case I just shared about the person not complying with the drug evaluation. They hadn't 
hadn't completed that. And so they hadn't complied with the court's orders. And then they're coming in and asking the court to change their orders. And the court's like, you haven't even complied with what I've already asked you to do. So why am I going to change my parenting time orders? So it's, it's really an uphill battle in those situations. And so you can't, you know, you can't ask a judge to, to do, to, to give you things that you're asking for when you haven't even done what they've asked you to do. That tells them that this isn't important to you or you would have made it happen. Um, one of the things I see happen a lot is somebody will have an order for a certain amount of parenting time. Um, let's say they have 20% parenting time. Um, and then they'll go in and say, you know, maybe they have every other weekend and then they'll go in and say, well, I want every other weekend and a weekday overnight, but they haven't been even showing up for their every other weekend. They're showing up maybe one, one Saturday a month, or they cancel a lot or they reschedule. And so the court's going to go, well, you're not even using the parenting time you have. Why would I order more parenting time for you? And that makes a lot of sense if you step back from the bigger picture and think about it. But we tend to just kind of go in based on our emotions and based on what we think is reasonable and ask certain things of the court. But if you're not following the previous orders that the court already made, then that's sort of just like a slap in the face to the court. To, to where you say, I don't really care what orders you've made. I don't care what you've told me to do. I'm not going to do it. And, and, but, but now I want you to, to increase my parenting time or do all these things. And the court's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And then consequently we feel frustrated, but it's not really the system that we should feel frustrated with. It's our own selves because we're not doing what's required in order to be able to push our case forward into that next step. And so this takes a lot of like really laying your pride down and understanding that the court's the one in control at this point. If you and the other parent can't agree, and this is why I always say, if you can reach agreement with the other parent, you're better off. But if you can't, you're putting the control of your parenting in the hands of that judge who is doing their best to make the decisions that need to be made. But look, you're not always going to agree with them because you're not the same person as them. You don't have the same value system. You don't have the same worldview. You don't have the same life experiences. And so, yeah, you're not going to see eye to eye on everything with your co-parent or the judge or anybody else in your situation. But you do have to understand and respect the fact that that judge is the one that is in control. And so the more of these mistakes that you make and the more that you give the court the impression that you don't respect the process, you don't respect them, you don't respect their orders, you don't respect their questions, you know, all of those things, then it's going to get worse and worse and worse for you. And the way to turn that tide, even if you've made those mistakes in the past, is to start to do those things, to show respect to the court to keep your arguments brief and focused, to make sure that you're following all the previous court orders, to answer questions as succinctly as you can, and to not do things that tell them they're wrong, but instead take responsibility for whatever it is that they wanted you to do instead of trying to undo it by telling them they were wrong. Okay, so this will give you a lot more success in court if you can learn to apply these things to your case. If you're watching me on YouTube, please hit like on this video and also subscribe to our channel so you get notified when new episodes come out each week. Also, if you're listening to the podcast, don't forget to rate and review me and also click subscribe so you get notified as I release new episodes each week. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Divorce University online podcast with your host, Tammy Ferreira. For more information, visit www.divorceuniversityonline.com.